All right. So um, you guys had your breakout room conversations discussing the differences and the similarities between the style of speech given by Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Um, you guys discussed the um, similarities and differences in the message of the speeches given by Dr. King and Martin and Malcolm X. And then finally, what new understandings of Martin Luther King did you gain through the engagement of his work? Um, who wants to discuss or talk about what was mentioned in your breakout rooms? Um, I would like to talk about question number one. In my group, we discussed that one of the differences between the readings, Martin Luther King's and MAK, was that um, Martin Luther King sticks to the um, to being well, his words are. I'm not gonna say they're not inappropriate, but they're more expand. Um, he's he uses more big words and tries to demonstrate that he's educated and well. Um, and however, MIK is more like he tries to demonstrate the well. His words are more. And they're understandable, but they're more simple and straight up. And Martin Luther King, he's like, they're big, big words. And he's also understandable. But like my classmate said, um, he tries to make everyone being able to understand, but with, with big words. Let me correct me if I'm wrong, Arcelli. Um so what you're picking up in the differences between Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, as far as their style, is one, um, you feel Martin Luther King uses a little bit more of a, a robust, a wider, broader vocabulary. You'll see more um, bigger words used. Um, yeah. Malcolm X is more direct. Um, they both deliver a speech in a way that is relatable and understandable, but you mm -hmm. hear a little bit more of an academic type of language of Martin Luther yeah. King than you That's, do with uh -huh. Malcolm X. Yeah. Okay. That's what I mean. And I think that's very astute. And I think, and the reason why I want to make sure I was understanding you correctly is because why do you guys feel the differences between Martin Luther King sounding more academic and then Malcolm X sounding more um, street, if you will, right? And, and then think about their backgrounds and think about who they are as, a, as, as people, right? Who is, who is Martin Luther King? What does he do with his occupation? You know, one knows he's a preacher, right? So that's going to lend him to sounding a certain type of way, right? Martin Luther King is also a doctor. He has his PhD. So when you talk about him sounding more academic, it would make sense as to why he sounds academic because he, he has a doctor in philosophy, right? Um, what is Malcolm X's background? He comes from the streets. He's a street hustler, right? He, he's a... Um, revitalized and um, uh, a reformed street hustler. So his language and his articulation is gonna lean more towards that reality. So that's a very good call out, RCLE. Who else wants to discuss what you guys talked about in your breakout rooms? No, uh, you brought up like what I was gonna end up bringing up about like the, the like delivery of the speech. Mm -hmm. Cause I was thinking about like, I was listening to both and Martin Luther King had like type of a, it almost sounded like a reverend was like preaching. So that made sense with his background, like being like a minister and like, it just made more sense. And then of course, Malcolm X, like how you said, he's like more street, street wise. So he was like, basically it was like a stronger, like more like provocative message that he was sending out other than Martin Luther King, which was, he was trying to be more, more calm and trying to like, give out those words of like, uh, how do you say like, it was, just, it was just like peaceful. He just wanted to be more peaceful. And wow, Malcolm X was the opposite. Like he wanted to empower more people in a more radical way. Yeah, less, less patient. Um, yeah. Ricardo, Ricardo. Um, who wants to talk about any new revelations or new understandings of Martin Luther King that they found through engaging this this particular work, because normally when we hear Martin Luther King, it's always the I have a dream, Martin Luther King. And to me, this is vastly different from I have a dream.
So this uh, version of Martin Luther King sounded familiar familiar to you all. Nothing new was found. Okay, that's fair. Um, I, uh, think, I have a question. Yeah. He talk about a promised land, and I don't understand the metaphor or what is that. Yeah, um, great, great question, Dulce, because it's, it's very important to understand what he's up to. Um, so this idea of this notion of the promised land has very strong religious connotations. So um, another way to think about the promised land is to think heaven. Um, Muslims will call it paradise, um, but it, it's, you know, it's the afterlife. So once you die and once you um, lived a, a life that's right according to Christ, um, then you're able to make it into heaven, right? So, so this is what they mean by the promised land. Um, also, picking up from the story of Moses um, and his ability to liberate the um, people, his people from the Pharaoh of Egypt, and they were able to travel outside of Egypt to their promised land. I believe it's called Canaan um, in, the, in the biblical story, um, but it's also metaphorical for the, um, you know, for heaven, for, for a place that's better than your current circumstances. And what happens, Dulce, is as African people begin to experience enslavement and religion is used as a justification for their enslavement, what the um, plantation owners and the uh, preachers on the plantation would preach is, you know, be obedient, be subservient, right? Be docile now, listen to your master now, although your life is bad, if you do these things, you will get your reward in the promised land. So when you die because you were a faithful servant, you'll be able to make it into heaven and you'll, you'll reap all the rewards at that point. Does that make a little more sense for you, Dulce? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, another thing for me that really stood out listening to the speech and, and thinking about it in comparison to Malcolm X is the, um, the tempo of Martin Luther King's speech is very slow. Like he really uses that silent pause. And, and there's just like a lot of dead space in, in his speech giving. Um, I liken that to his spatial reality. Again, he's 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 in he's from the South. He's in Memphis, Tennessee, giving this speech. Um, anyone familiar with the South? The tempo is very slow. It's very 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 slow, right? So and, and you hear that um, emulated in the way that Martin Luther King is delivering his speech. So this is this speech was given April 3rd, um, 1968. This would be Martin Luther King's last speech. I believe a few days later, he would be assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, but some of the things that really stood out to me, again, this notion of unity, right? This idea of unity of all, among all oppressed people. This is something that you hear not only in Martin Luther King's speech, but you also hear that in Malcolm X's speech, right? And he says that um, unity among the enslaved or unity among slave folks will eliminate enslavement. And he uses the example of Pharaoh. Um, anytime he wanted to oppress the um, oppress his people, he made sure that the slaves fought among themselves. So the only way to stop that or to counterbalance that is to have those enslaved people um, unite. Um, he says human rights issue is the issue that are facing all people of color throughout the world. So again, it's also something that's very um, familiar to what Malcolm is arguing, changing this idea of it being a civil rights issue to more of a human rights issue, changing the focal point from being just the United States to people of color, people of culture throughout the world who are globally oppressed. And he's advocating for a human rights revolution. So again, thinking about Ricardo's um, thinking you know, and it's often positioned that Malcolm X is the more radical one. But if you're listening to what, Mal uh, what Martin Luther King is up to in this particular speech, it's a lot more radical in tempo and temperature than a lot of his former speeches. Um, anytime you're talking about a worldwide revolution, you're really getting to something that's very radical, right? And I, and I don't think that it's happenstance that this was the last speech that he gave before he was assassinated due to the fact that he's talking about uh, all oppressed people of the world. Um, he's also organizing around workers' rights, right? Um, in, in this particular case, he's organizing around the um, sanitation workers. But a part of his claim, a part of his critique is to call the responsibility of the United States of, 
living up to what they claim to be about on paper, right? So if you're saying that you're about liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness, you must be about liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone, right? So let's push the United States to be what they say they are, right? Um, and he also speaks, and, and so this is where you can find a difference between what Malcolm X is talking about and what Ma Martin Luther King is talking about. While Martin Luther King, while Malcolm X, excuse me, seeks to separate the church and politics, right? So he'll come up with the organization of Afro-American unity to fight the political front, and then Muslim Mosque Incorporated to fight the religious front. Martin Luther King thinks there should be an intersection with religion and politics, right? He feels that real preachers will um, be pick up the fight of the civil rights movement, will pick up the fight of human rights, and it shouldn't be so self-serving. In fact, he critiques a lot of these self-serving preachers saying that they're not doing what God intended them to do because they're not getting amongst the people and advocating for their quality of life to improve, right? Um, focus on the problems of the poor, right? He starts the poor people's movement and he likens this to the work that Jesus would do, right? Staying true to his um, background as a minister, he invokes the work of Jesus and Jesus' ability to be with the poor, the downtrodden. And he says, this is the work that the movement should do as well, be for the poor and downtrodden people. Um, and again, he ties this to the critique of self-serving preachers because he says, it's not, I mean, he uses the example of the, um, the man who was hurt in the road, the Good Samaritan story, right? And he says, it's not about the Samaritan thinking about what's best for him, right? It's not about the preachers thinking about what's best for them. It's about the preachers and the Samaritan thinking about what's best for those who are injured, for those who are less fortunate, right? And this is the work that the parable of the Good Samaritan is telling and this is the work that Martin Luther King feels that the preacher should be doing also, not improving their personal conditions, but improving the conditions of those who are less fortunate throughout the world. Um, another thing that is very similar to what Malcolm X is talking about, the economic power base of the black community, right? While um, Martin Luther King is talking about utilizing that power base from a standpoint of boycotting, right? Boycotting Coca-Cola. Um, Martin Luther King thinks about it more from a standpoint of pulling that money together and building for the black community. Martin Luther King is thinking about this in the sense of pulling that money together and extracting it from the white communities or from the power base, right? And lastly, for me, I felt an overwhelming sense of urgency in Martin Luther King's speech, especially in that way that he closes out the speech, right? I may not get there with you right? Longevity has its rewards, right? He knows his time is coming to an end. And I think about even the way he starts the speech, right? He's asked if he could go back to any epic or any era, historical era. And he talks about going back to Kemet. He says he wouldn't stay there. He talks about going to Greece. He says he wouldn't stay there. He talks about going to the Roman Empire. He says he would not stay there. Um, and he says, you know, if he had a choice, he would want to situate himself in the coming of the 20th century, right? In the years to come, because his optimism and his hope and his belief that America will right its wrongs, right? And do the ethical thing and rectify this race problem that leaves him with hope. And I think we have the, um, the ability and the fortune of hindsight to know that that hope that he was resting on did not necessarily come to fruition um, because ultimately he would lose his life a few days later. And more ultimately, uh, we're still dealing with a lot of the issues that he was advocating against back in 1968, right? So those are my notes for the reading. Um, we'll jump into our fishbowl. I think the majority of you guys have fishbowl already. I um, mean, if, if you have, that's cool too. But if you have not done your two for the semester, please take advantage of this time because we're getting close to the end of the semester. And then I also want to leave you guys before we end today, um, give you guys the opportunity to pick out your um, songs to form your group. So, uh, give me one second. 
I, Jaime, do me a favor, man. Ask your question to the class, and I want I would like to know what your class thinks. I think it's a very profound question. Can you say that out loud? Uh, is there a question that I had? Because you know how throughout the years, elementary, middle school, and high school, that that's all they would teach us from Martin Luther King. It's just they would show just this, just the speech he gave that I had a dream. That's the only video they'll te they'll show us, and never like uh, what's it called? Never go into detail of Martin Luther King. And I was just like, why did they? just show us just I had a dream and stuff that like they just make us believe that the speech was trying to get white and blacks together or I don't I don't really know yeah I think that's a very profound question Jaime so what Jaime is asking and, and I would like the rest of the class to try to to address this so Jessica Ricoyo, Samina, Dulce, Nick, Ricardo, Emily, Arcieli think about this why do you think when you guys were presented with the information about Martin Luther King when you were told Martin Luther King's story the only story that you heard was, I have a dream. Why do you think that is? That's a pretty good question. <laughs> um, well, personally, I believe that they introduced that story to us because besides it's the last story he wrote, also is the i don't know <laughs> i'm trying to think of something but yeah anybody else have an idea why do you think that i have a dream is what's always taught about when we talk about martin luther king jessica what do you think sorry oh i'm at work um so I don't know I think maybe because at the time they introduced us to that speech we were very young I remember like learning about that like in third grade so maybe they didn't want to teach all the background that came to it and like usually they don't teach any kind of African-American history so I think that's probably like was the simplest way for us to understand I'm not too sure though okay I'll take that uh, yeah, Samina? yeah I would like to add I also think that they did that because it's easier like as a young child, it's easier for you to remember like a speech or something. And so they knew like if they taught the speech and that would stick with Martin Luther King. Yeah, I think so too. So a lot of what I'm hearing, you guys are attesting that to, you know, youth, your childhood, your processing when you were young. Um, I agree, because when you think about it, they don't really talk about Martin Luther King that much, right? In college um, and even in high school, we've not really talked about so I, I think you guys are on to something with um, thinking about when you're receiving this message and you're receiving it during your youth. Um, I think Jessica and Samina is right in the sense that it's very uncomplicated, right? It's a very easy um, thing to deliver. It's digestible and it's, and I'll add on, right? It's, it's easy to lead one to believe by receiving that I had a dream speech that things have gotten better. That fits a very neat narrative of racial issues in America, right? Um, we had this problem of this thing that called racism happened a long time ago in the 60s. We had a guy, a great guy named Martin Luther King, who we have a day off named after him. He gave a great speech, I have a dream. His dream came true and things are good. We don't have to worry about the, the racial problems anymore, right? It fits a very neat narrative let's let's reverse engineer jaime's question so jaime's question is why do we only learn about i have a dream martin luther king so let's re reverse engineer that and i would ask the question why is it that we don't learn about the i have been to the mountaintop martin luther king why do you think this speech is not talked about in your K through 12 experience. Uh, can I say my opinion? Yeah, I think I think both men are trying to encourage youth and and give them the reality of what is happening in society. And because we are young, they they don't want us to like fight, fight for the same the same cause they were fighting. So they, they don't want us to know the reality. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. No, I, and I think you're absolutely right, Dulce. And their, their desire to keep that truth 
from reaching the masses still continues today. And that's why they're not allowing certain things to be taught in school now, right? That's why they're in the courts um, fighting against things like critical race theory, because they don't want that version of reality to be made um, public, right? But again, you know, why are, why are we not hearing about the I've been to the mountaintop speech? Why do you think the powers that be, the government, whatever, whoever you want to pin this on, is preventing us from learning about this version of Martin Luther King? Yeah. So I'm looking at the chat, right? And Rosoyo says, I think that I have been to the mountaintop is emphasizing that racism is still here, still there, and still needs to be proactively fixed. And I have a dream is more reactive and less of a call for action. Absolutely. Um, also, right, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King is not more so focused solely on civil rights issues for black people. He's focusing on all poor people, right? So that is unifying not only black folks, but also poor whites, right? Also the indigenous community, also the Asian community, right? And this falls in line with what's going on at the time, because think about 1968. What's really popular in 1968 is the anti-war movement. And the anti-war movement is not only being picked up by black folks, everyone is on page with the anti-war anti movement, excuse me. So you have poor whites, you have wealthy whites, you have um, students all across the board who are on board with this um, anti-war movement, right? So when you start to hear this rhetoric and you start to hear someone like a Martin Luther King being able to galvanize all of society, not just one segment of the society, this becomes very threatening to the power structure that is the United States, right? Um, if you think about the history of whiteness and where whiteness really starts to have its um, hold on the United States in the Western psyche, is at the time when black formerly enslaved Africans are achieving economic abilities, right? They're, 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 um, they're starting to make money. They're starting to put their kids through school during this time of reconstruction, right? So what happens is the power structure will say, well, for you poor whites, yeah, then black folks across the street, they may have more money than you. They may be able to send their kids to better colleges than you but you're still white. And that alone gives you a certain element of power over these black folks, right? So I bring this up to say that the last thing that the powers that be want is to have the different social classes uniting, right? They don't want all the poor black, white, and indigenous people getting together, right? They don't even want the, all the rich poor black, I'm sorry, all the rich black, white, and indigenous people getting together. They don't want these unity, these unity ties across class and nation status, right? This is also what got um, Fred Hampton in trouble. For those who've seen the movie, The um, Judas and the Black Messiah, which is about Fred Hampton, which made Fred Hampton such a threat, was the fact that he was organizing in Chicago um, the black gangs, the Latin gangs, the Latin kings, and the poor whites. And that was that is what made him the greatest threat to the power structure, right? This notion of, of liberty across class lines. Um, I'm gonna. Hey Jaime, have how many fish bowls have you done, Jaime? Jaime, have you done two two fish bowls already? Yes or no? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My bad. Okay. Um. I was going to count that as one of your fish bowls. So let me get, let's get some people on, on record so we get this fish bowl and guy, get you guys the, your points. Um, Samina, have you gone fish bowl twice? Yeah, I already went twice. Okay. Cool, thank you. Dulce, have you gone fish bowl twice? Yes. Okay. I think most of you have, but I, I just want to double check. Arcieli, have you went gone fish bowl twice? Yes, I have, Professor. Okay. Uh, Ricardo, have you went? Fishbowl? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Nick, how about you? Have you fishbowl twice? I have, yeah. Emily, have you fishbowl twice? Yes, I have. Okay. Ricardo, have you fishbowl twice? 
Yeah, I have. Okay. And then Jessica, have you fish bowl twice? Yes, I have. Okay, bet. So we're we're this group is done with their fish bowl. Um, so let's do this. With the last 15 minutes, um, any questions, comments, or concerns you guys have, or any thoughts about what was discussed in the in the um, speech by Martin Luther King? What do you think about his um, need to organize the poor people and his notions of the poor people's campaign? What were some thoughts on that? So, Samina, what stood out to you most about the speech? Nothing really stood out to me, honestly. <laughs> okay, well, uh, give me something that you thought about it. So, what'd you think about it? Nothing stood out. What'd you think about it then, Samina? Um, I don't know. All right, give me something, and then we're gonna. Cause I'm gonna uh, ideally, I'm gonna go through all you guys. I just want one thought about the speech, and then we'll call it a day. Okay. <laughs> so, so give me something, Samina. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hold on. Let me get my notes. Right, I'm gonna come back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dulce, give me one thought that you had about the speech. Anything, no right or wrong answer. From Malcolm or the... Uh, let's, let's stay with um, Martin Luther King. Um, or you can tell me which one you like better. Who were you? Who spoke to you more? That could also be a point of conversation. I really like uh, how the better the Malcolm X speech because he said something that really put me on thinking about the situation when he said the we don't you don't take your case to to the criminal mm -hmm. you take your criminal your criminal to court and i thought that was like something like the reality yes. of what is going on thank you um Arcieli, uh, what share some thoughts either about martin martin Luther king's speech or who's style or whose method you speak uh, speaks to you more martin luther king or well martin honestly king. i like both i like the fact that um martin luther king tries to stay really with his academic language he tries to um well his speech is basically for everyone to understand and it's really educated and i like that but also i think if i was to choose between both i would choose on my case because what he's trying to do is trying to do the reality of what he really is. He's not trying to act. Um, well, basically, what he's trying to show in his in his writing is that um, he's well, his personality, basically, the personality of his culture and what he's fighting for. That's something that, um, and he's pretty straightforward. So that's something that I noticed between both of the readings that stood out to me. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, can I go? Can I yeah. go? It's okay. What's it called? I just, I like Malcolm X. I really like that. He's a person that, uh, he's really a straight up person that he goes, he tells you everything straightforward of what he says and like that. And that to me is big because I like when it's people are straightforward instead of telling you in another way and stuff, might as well just keep it straight and just say it like that for you want, for you want, what's it called? Find out in another way. Yeah, yeah straight shooter. Absolutely. Uh, Nick, what are your thoughts? Uh, I think I like King's speech more. Okay. I liked how he 
he uh for the thing that you said like he wanted it to be a civil rights issue to become a human rights rights issue and how it was an american issue to a global issue i like that a lot how he made it like a more important thing to look at yeah thank you uh emily uh one thing i noticed from both speeches is that they both use um repetition a lot uh as a way to emphasize on certain points of the speech and i thought that was really important great call out emily absolutely uh ricardo yeah after well after hearing like both speeches i didn't come to realize like how how you said like that this speech that the mlk gave was way different than the i have a dream so that gave me a different perspective of like who was he really like as an at like activist and seeing how he wasn't so different from from malcolm x in his ideology but just in the delivery and the way he carried himself that's what like make them like like would distinguish him from like his other counterpart yeah great call out ricardo thank you man uh jessica um yeah i was basically gonna say the same thing i like how in this speech you kind of see more of his act, like how much of an activist he was and just his style overall like how he presents himself and how he communicates that um i think i really really enjoyed that yeah. i was gonna ask you though professor who um whose style do you prefer <laughs> okay yeah. question answer um so why though why um there's a couple of things I, I think like i was born in 83 right so if um in 91 or 92 spike lee put out the movie malcolm x right and like that was a uh like a cultural phenomenon and i remember going to um at the time it was the magic, magic johnson theater to go watch the movie and like that left a very indelible impression on me right so that's just off from a cultural standpoint that that's one thing that like really impressed upon me um but then as i got older i started to kind of read more you know what malcolm was doing and who malcolm was and, and the changes that he went through um it just i just gravitated to that a little bit more um and i also think that why youth culture is more aligned with malcolm than martin like Malcolm kind of embodies the hip hop attitude of I'm gonna just tell it like it is. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I'm not going to um, say it in a way that you feel comfortable, right? Um, there was just like a fierce manhood about Malcolm X that to me is lacking very much so in today's world. Um, and just his, his commitment to truth and his um, not allowing fear to shift the way that he moves for me is really what uh, uh, gravitates Mal Ma me to Malcolm, if that answers your question. Uh, Samina? Okay, so um, I like Malcolm's uh, speech better because um, you don't really learn about Malcolm X in school. Like they always show you Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King, like the main people, but they don't show like Martin Luther King and how he played a part into a lot of stuff. And so when I heard his speech, like it really stood out to me because you know it wasn't like I had really heard many speeches from him. So, um, one thing I will say though, Harriet Tubman is a bad motherfucker. Like if y'all don't know about Harriet Tubman, like all hats off to Malcolm. But what Harriet Tubman was doing and what she did, homie, like oh my god. Um, so it, yeah, I, if you have some time, go do some research on her. Um, they don't call her Moses for nothing. Like she was, she's a real one. Um, but I do want to say before we go, I want to pick back up on something that Dulce mentioned, right? You don't take the criminal to his own court. You don't take the criminal to his own court and expect him to be found guilty. Anybody here familiar with Kyle Rittenhouse? No? Well, I've just been like, not like kind of keeping up it's been popping up every so often and just hearing little details at like at each day of the trial yeah. but yeah so what kyle rittenhouse did okay just for those who don't know um i think not now he's 19 or 18. at the time that he did what he did he was not um of, of legal age yet he was i think 17. 
He lives in Illinois. He drives across three, two or three states um, to the protests that are happening in Missouri. And he has his AR-15 with him that he drives across two separate states, two or three separate states, uh, AR-15. So it's not like a, it's a Glock. It's not like it's a, a 45 where it's concealed. We're talking about an assault rifle, right? He goes to the protests and he proceeds to shoot protesters, killing two or three of them. Takes his AR-15, walks past the police barricade, flashes them some kind of sign, gets some water, and is and drives back to Illinois, right? So he's currently on trial for this act. In the trial, you cannot refer to the victims who he killed as victims, right? That's not permissible within the court. You cannot call the victims victims, right? The judge's phone goes off in the middle of court and the ringtone for the judge's phone is the same theme song to Trump's campaign rally. So when Malcolm talks about taking the criminals to his court, this is what he's talking about, right? So in my estimation, why are we even having a trial? He shouldn't have had the gun in the first place. He drove multiple states and he murdered people. So in my estimations, this is intentional. This is an intended murder, right? He knew what he was doing. It's premeditated murder. And let's not forget the fact that he's not even old enough to have a firearm in the first place. But let's see how this pans out. I don't think he's going to get charged. So I would encourage you guys to um, pay a little attention to that. Not too much attention because it might piss you the fuck off. But just be aware of what's going on, right? And as you're being aware of what's going on, think about Baldwin. Think about the pillars of white inferiority, right? And that one pillar of maintaining white innocence. And let's see how they maintain this little white boy's innocence. I don't know if y'all seen him on the on the stand fake crying. It's just it, it's the ridiculousness of it all. It's just crazy. Um. So 